Okay. That should be up and running. We are, and there's one person. Okay. Welcome. Hello, I'm HD Tudor, and you join me today with Julia Friedman, who's going to be posing your questions to me. So she has the power to put your questions to me. I'm not going to be conducting the live stream in the traditional sense. I'm just going to be here to answer the questions. And it's Julia who's going to be keeping good order amongst you all. So she's the one that's going to be wielding the whip in case you stray out of line. So get your questions ready, make them interesting, and Julia will select them and put them to me, and we will take it from there. So, Julia, hello to you. Hello, hello, and hello to everybody. Uh, as people are coming in, I am actually going to start with a question of my own. Uh, I noticed that you have a new series uh, up running on the channel, Narcissism in Literature. Yes. That's the last thing we've spoken about. Mm -hmm. uh, you have three videos there so far. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, as a consequence of people asking me to analyze characters and literature, I decided, okay, let's bring forth some notable individuals who are evidently narcissists and talk more about their narcissism and why they are narcissists. So as you know, so far I've done Heathcliff and I did Jay Gatsby and also Becky Sharp from Vanity Fair. There are more in the pipeline and it's to allow people to understand naturally more about narcissism. But also I often get asked about, you know, is this person uh, a narcissist? And it's important, as I always explain, when you're dealing with fictional narcissists, they don't necessarily always quite fit the mold because of the necessity of uh, character development and story arc, etc. So I've done very detailed examinations of those individuals. They take quite a lot of time. But uh, there's going to be more that I'm going to analyze. I'm not going to say who is in the pipeline. I don't want to spoil the anticipation for people, but there are more. There are at least three that are going to be released over the coming weeks, and probably more than that, but there's definitely three that are ready to be spoken about. Excellent. Thank you so much. And actually, I, I thought um, Heathcliff uh, seemed very close to home for you. He, he is an interesting character. I studied Withering Heights at A-level, so it's something that I've read many times. And as a consequence of that, and there are some similarities um, in the way that we look at the world and th some of the things that we have achieved and relationships with other people. So there is, I suppose, a resonance there. I certainly wasn't found as an urchin on the streets of Liverpool, though. <laughs> <laughs> I can safely say that. Right. Right. Do you, uh, one last thing about, one last question about the series. Do you write uh, these out? Because it, it seemed, uh, it, it seemed at least with Heathcliff, it seemed like a uh, really well-ordered uh, essay. Yes. What I do is I look for certain sections of text, obviously from the books, and uh, order that and write my thoughts down. So when I, as you know, with certain videos, I will pick a topic about narcissism and I speak ad hoc about it. Yeah. Uh, when I do the ones about this one's wife, I do often off the back of a news article interspersed with my observations. With these, it's a prepared text, which I've sat down and typed out beforehand. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. And I'm very much looking forward to uh, more in that series. And I recommend that everyone checks it out if you haven't, uh, if you haven't found it yet. Okay. So we'll start with the uh, light question. Mm -hmm. Here you go. Okay. <laughs> Do you ever talk to the creature on purpose? No. That's the short answer. Okay. Lynn, hi, HG. If you could go anywhere in the world to sample the cuisine, where would you go? That's interesting. I like Thai food, so I think probably Thailand would be a choice in that respect. 
All right. And now for the middle. Could a particularly intelligent greater narcissist take your empath detector and answer it deliberately to get the result that they are an empath? No greater narcissist would do that. They would deem it as inappropriate. They don't need to know, and nor would they necessarily, nor would they go around masquerading as an empath. So it's not something that would happen. They simply wouldn't be interested in doing that in the same way that no greater narcissist is interested in my work because they already know what they are. So that just wouldn't happen. Okay. And uh, this is the, the next one is kind of um, uh, a follow up to your analysis. Hi, HG. Would you critique Black Jack Randall from Outlander? There's a lot of thought dedicated to this one. I think I watched about three episodes of Outlander and then didn't watch it any further. I think something else commanded my attention. So I'm not familiar with who Black Jack Randall is. It doesn't ring any bells with me, and perhaps I hadn't come across that character, although I know the program. So I'd have to say that Black Jack Randall, although that's an interesting name, isn't on my immediate list of those that I would analyze. But if you want to make a case for me to suggest why I should analyze Black Jack Randall, feel free to email me and set out, don't send me an essay, It'll be uh, too long, don't read. But it's um, send me some bullet points, and if I think that that would be an interesting character, because what you have to bear in mind is, when I do these analyses, they have to be done properly, and there's a lot of work that goes into them, and that's why it's important to select individuals that are well known. And I know that there are some which are interesting, but as I repeatedly point out, that. There are really interesting individuals, but they don't necessarily get the views that they perhaps ought to. And because my time is limited, I need to balance analyses which are interesting with ones that are going to capture people's attention. So what you need to consider is if you want to suggest somebody to me is why are they interesting? Why are they useful with regard to narcissism? And is this somebody that a lot of people would be interested in learning about? Okay, and the next question is, again, something completely different. Do you ever play with your nieces and nephews? It sounds like children could have a lot of fun with you. I've said before that children are not something that I'm particularly interested in. I don't have any, but I do have nieces and nephews. They do regard me as very interesting because I... I'm not always around because I have other things that I'm about. So when I do appear, I think I sometimes appear as almost like this figure that comes out of the mist to them. So I'm slightly mythical. I do play with them. Um, I'll play games, sort of board games with them. And I admit I do enjoy winding them up by cheating. And in other instances, I'll play, you know, play football with them, uh, play imaginative games in the garden when they were younger, etc. So I do that, which, of course, is all part of controlling them and drawing fuel from them. But there will be occasions where they'll pester me to want to play, and I'll refuse to do so because it doesn't interest me. And uh, it's flattering that they want me to be involved, but I won't always because I'll be dealing with something else. Or I might be having a conversation with a number of member of the family, and they need to learn some manners and wait. Right. Uh, do Actually, uh, do dogs like you? Do dogs feel anything? I don't tend to bother with them as I think they're smelly, disgusting creatures that go around sniffing feces. And then if anybody allows themselves to be licked by a dog, then you're, well, really, it's quite disgusting. Um, dogs don't really take to me. I think they're somewhat wary of me. It might be the electric cattle prod that I carry. I don't know. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, and here's a good one. Are all control freaks narcissists? No, not necessarily. You will have some people that have set routines in the way that they do things, which might be linked to, say, some kind of anxiety disorder. You might have uh, people who, although it's uh, not the only symptom of OCD, 
often with OCD, it's having intrusive thoughts, but it may well be that certain people have a need to do things in a particular order and need to have a control over that. I think also there's a case to be argued that some people who are autistic have a degree of control over their environments. They don't like necessarily change and so forth. And I think many of those people would be described as control freaks, but they're not narcissists. So narcissists, as you know, very much do need control. And that can manifest not necessarily in such an obvious manner as might be with regard to somebody who always wants things done in a particular way. So it's interesting that you might actually find somebody that you would go, goodness me, what a control freak that isn't a narcissist. And you could come across a narcissist and not necessarily think that they're a control freak because the way that they gain control, obviously through the three assertions of control, you might not be as aware of that they are, they are being controlling. So even though the narcissist's need for control might be even greater than that of, say, of an autistic person, it might not stand out as much. And now another personal question. Can you cook? Yes. Cook well? Yes. Do you cook often? No. Uh, do you often eat out? Yes. Do you often order food in? No. There we are. All bases covered there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> how about some um, learning okay would you ever consider doing seminars at some point i have already considered it night of dune and it is something that i think i will do at a future point there are two bases behind that the first is obviously i could do seminars online whilst protecting my identity so it would be spending time if you will, creating a framework for doing that. So that's the first point. The second aspect is that doing seminars in person would allow me, and maybe even sort of lectures, would allow me to reach more people. I think there's a case at some point for me to get on the lecture tour, if you will, to meet many of the people that have been loyal followers of mine and to engage with more people. And it may prove a, a means of getting more people involved. And that may well be linked also to the issue of the Tudor Academy that I've uh, alluded to previously. I think those aren't immediate plans because there's still work that I want to do. And I think when it gets to a point where I feel that I've stated much about what um, what I can say about certain aspects of narcissism and psychopathy, that ultimately I will look at doing that as the next level with the creation of, I say, the Tudor Academy and teaching people so that they can then perhaps go on and teach other people about narcissism, et cetera. But uh, certainly seminars are something I've considered and they're certainly something that remain on the agenda for me. Okay. Could a very narcissistic empath be mistaken as a narcissist? Yes, you could have an individual that has, who is empathic, that has strong narcissistic traits, and there may well be a situation of a diminution of that emotional empathy, so their narcissistic traits come to the fore, and they behave in a particular way, which could cause them to be seen as a narcissist. So. I, an empath generally could be mistaken as a narcissist as a consequence of an external stressor. And it follows that if that particular empath has strong empathic traits and strong narcissistic traits, and those empathic traits ordinarily keep those narcissistic traits in check, then if something external impacts upon that emotional empathy and reduces it, and those empathic traits row back, you will see the narcissistic traits come to the fore. So it's very much the case that they could be mistaken for being a narcissist, yes. Right. Uh, can I actually follow up uh, with another question? Uh, yes. There. The, um, so in the situation where you have uh, an empath and the empath is being manipulated by a narcissistic person, mm -hmm. would that uh, have the same effect on the empath as, as if they were manipulated by a narcissist? Yes. Um, it's an external stressor. So an external stressor is commonly being abused, um, but it also could be that someone is manipulating you, which is a form of abuse, of course, but it might be done in a very subtle way. An external stressor is 
being drunk, taking drugs, being ill, being lonely, being bereaved, being under financial pressure, being stressed. So a narcissistic person, albeit not a narcissist, if they're manipulating somebody, that's an external stressor, which could result in a diminution of the, that person's emotional empathy with the consequence that they act out, if you will, and may well respond with a form of reactive abuse, which makes them look like a narcissist. And would it uh, also activate the addiction? The addiction is only linked to narcissists, not to narcissistic people. I see. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Uh, about this. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, I have done this one. What is a bad habit of yours? You th what makes you think I've got any bad habits? <laughs> All my habits are good ones. Um, I actually don't have any bad habits. I think perhaps there'd be other people that would say a particular habit of mine might be viewed as bad for them, but it's not bad for me. But I don't sit picking my nose, for instance, or fail to brush my teeth or eat copious amounts of uh, junk food or such like. So I wouldn't say that I've got any bad habits. <laughs> Okay. Would a lower grader recognize not only an upper grader, but recognize that they are operating at a higher level? Well, they wouldn't necessarily recognize that it's another grader. So they would have their own terminology, which is uh, used by them. They would recognize that they were dealing with someone similar to themselves. That's essentially what they would notice. Okay. Uh, what about this? The title super empath implies that they are better empaths. Well, that's a matter of interpretation, but I agree that there are some that takes it to mean that they are somehow better empaths. But if they will resist and fight back at an earlier stage than other empaths, they're surely lesser empaths being more normal. Well, I don't think that's right. They're just a different type of empath. The term super isn't to denote that they're better than any other kind, just a different type. And the fact of them resisting and fighting back at an earlier stage doesn't mean that they're more like normals. It just means that they're a particular type of empath that behaves in that way. Um, I can understand why you would think that they would be like normals, because normals don't take the crap from the narcissist as much. But that's because they don't have the addiction. Super empaths have the addiction, but the way that it impacts on them is different as a consequence of the traits that they have. So it isn't the case of suggesting that they're better, but I agree that there are those that think it does. That's why we get these individuals, often unaware narcissists, that come along and say, I'm a super Hayoka ninja kick-ass empath, because it makes them sound, at least in their minds, good albeit that they're not. The blue ribbon effect. I beg your pardon? I said the blue ribbon effect. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Why are the dastardly duo? Who's that? Is that Muttley and Dick Dastardly? Never stopped or cancelled or held accountable. I truly don't understand how they keep getting opportunities and platforms. Well, one presumes that you're talking about this one's wife and the Prince of Pink Pancakes. Um, why they never held accountable? Well, that's because they ensure that they only interact with those that aren't going to do that. They are held accountable to the extent that there are plenty of journalists that call out their behavior. So that is holding them to account, albeit, of course, they will just ignore it. Similarly, they're held to account by people such as myself by calling out her narcissism and the shitty behavior that Prince Harry engages in. Why aren't they cancelled? Because there are still people that swallow the narrative. Remember, this one's wife serves an agenda for certain people of the idea that she has suffered as a consequence of interaction with those white colonialists. And therefore, it's those there are individuals, because of their own jaundice worldview, see her as having suffered and therefore they believe her. They're incapable of seeing that she's a narcissist. They think that she's been hard done to. And therefore, as a consequence of that, they end up thinking 
yeah, we'll support her. Hence, that's why uh, she hasn't been cancelled, because there are still people that will entertain her views. She's a useful idiot, in a way, to those individuals. Why are they not stopped? Well, the reason is, is that too many people still take notice of them, whether it's because they support this one's wife, which is a smaller group, or the much larger one is that they get something out of debating everything that she does, commenting on how she behaves, and also like to see her fail and dissect her many faux pas and failings in online forums, etc. The fact is, as I've said before, when people don't read about her, no longer watch videos about her, don't comment about her, then the conduits, the mainstream media and social media will realize there's no point putting an article out about her. There's no point creating a video about her because nobody's interested any longer. And then she'll stop getting the coverage, which will mean two things. One, you'll naturally hear less about her because she's not being covered. Therefore, you won't feel like she's got the momentum that you might think that she has now. And secondly, she isn't going to try as hard to go down that route because eventually her narcissism will recognize it's not working because people aren't going to cover her. So her, the narcissism will think there's no point trying to get the coverage any longer because it's not working. Remember, her narcissism needs to be efficient. And at the moment, it basically says, hey, let's walk across across a parking lot and get papped because we know that that's going to end up in the Daily Mail and there's going to be 4,000 outraged comments and then it's going to end up in other places as well. So basically, it means that if you want her stopped, stop reading about her, stop commenting on her, and if enough people do that. But the problem is you'll, you'll, you will almost get this kind of, um, well, everybody else stopped doing it, but I, I kind of still want to watch. And that'll be the attitude of everybody else will be, I agree, we need to stop watching, apart from me, because I still want to know what's going on. But you you, you lot over there, you stop watching her. And so what will happen is nobody will stop watching her because they want to see her fail. So she'll keep on getting reported on. And the newspapers know this. That's why they write the provocative articles that they do. That's why sometimes the Daily Mail, which you would think would absolutely hate her, sometimes write something which is vaguely complimentary because they know that people will get their panties in a bunch. That's true. The comment section in the uh, Daily Mail is uh, just... Yeah, the, da the Daily Mail cares about one thing, money, circulation. So all it's going to ever do is ensure that it's creating content that will either cause you to go, yes, that's right, stick it to her Daily Mail, she's an awful human being, or I can't believe that they've said that that thing that she's wearing is really nice, I'm outraged. <laughs> Point is, they're pro provoking a reaction, which, ironically enough, is precisely what a narcissist wants, isn't it? True, and then there's every other comment almost is, uh, why are you writing about her? Yeah. So she she, and her advisors know that, uh, and as Ted Sarandos said, she's good at creating attention, controversy. She is. The problem that she's got is where do you go with that? Because there comes a point when people are going to say, yeah, okay, you're, you're infamous, but we can't be associated with you because we don't want to be associated with somebody of that behavior. It makes us look bad. So then you don't get the deals, which is what she's experiencing now. Um, I have a video coming out about why she'll never succeed, which goes into detail as to the big problem that she's got. And uh, people will find that very interesting. Right. Okay, so here's a, something completely different. Okay, who cares? Hello, who cares? In narcissistic ensnarement, why should empaths be more concerned about emotional and financial infidelity than sexual infidelity from your perspective? Because with sexual infidelity, it was often with the narcissist that it might just be a one-off. So, for instance, it's knocking the hip out on a prostitute. And ultimately, in your relationship, what you should be asking yourself, what matters to you more? The fact that they found somebody sexually attractive and spent an hour with them doing the nasty or the fact that they've spoken about their innermost thoughts and hopes and desires and dreams to somebody rather than me, that they've talked about their problems with someone other than me, or that they're spending money, which our household needs, on somebody else. 
I really do think that when you put those three things side by side, the fact that the narcissist has gone and played hide the sausage elsewhere pales into insignificance compared to what the actual impact and weight of an emotional infidelity or a financial infidelity is. I see the consequences of that as far, as far more substantial compared to a sexual infidelity. Now, sometimes, of course, they become entwined. The narcissist is having an affair, so they're regularly having sex with somebody else who they also happen to unburden the innermost secrets that they have towards that individual and perhaps spending money on them as well. So you've got a triple whammy. But if you separate them out, the act of just um, bumping uglies with somebody is actually quite superficial compared to somebody pouring their heart out and talking to them and sharing and invariably spending a lot more time with them with that emotional aspect rather than a sexual one. So my perspective is such that I really do find it interesting that empaths get more bent out of shape because somebody's had sex with somebody rather than the instance of them engaging in an emotional or financial infidelity. Could that be, um, a uh, could that have to do with the love dirty trait? Um, I think, well, I think in part it might do, but the, being a love devotee can also link into the, the emotional intimacy that occurs b between two individuals. Um, mm -hmm. I think more likely it links into the narcissistic traits of the empath in terms of pride and vanity, mm -hmm. that they think, well, they obviously find that person more physically or sexually attractive than me because they've been having sex with them. And the emotional thinking jumps on those traits and corrupts them and causes them to get bent out of shape about it. So they learn that their partner has been having sex with somebody else and quite possibly may well be talking about, oh, you know, you know, uh, pouring their heart out in, in that respect as well. And of the two things, they're more troubled by the fact that they've been having sex rather than uh, sharing emotional intimacies. And I think it is because they see that as, um, I suppose part of it is that you might share emotional intimacies with a friend as well, whereas you regard a sexual intimacy as something that's almost uh, exclusive to the relationship that you're in romantically. So you, as an individual, you might have a problem, so you might talk to your parents about it, you might talk to a friend about it, you might speak to a colleague about it, but you're not having sex with those people. You're only having sex with your sexual partner. So I think that's possibly some of it, that you have that idea of exclusivity. So when that person goes and has sex with somebody else, they're doing something that you ordinarily wouldn't countenance doing with something else, whereas if they're going and pouring their heart out to somebody else, you might not see it as bad because you think, well, you know, they're talking to somebody else. I, I could talk to somebody else. You might not necessarily see that as an infidelity. But ultimately, I would think that you should see it as more important because they're spending far more time with this individual, telling their inmost secrets, sharing information and so forth, which is a deeper act than just, as I said, having sex with somebody. Spoken as a true narcissist. <laughs> And I, I should uh, um, concur here that it's the same with narcissistic people. Okay. There we go. Um, Favorite part year in history and why? The year of my birth, naturally. <laughs> um, other than that, the early medieval period is one that I am interested in because I've always been uh, in, in England. I've always liked uh, from being a young boy, castles and knights and understanding, for instance, where the system of rank and title has come from, which is interesting. You know, that uh, dukedoms first appeared, I think, in around 1337. The Duchy of Cornwall was the first one that was granted. And uh, that then took over from the concept of an earl, which had come from Scandinavia where that was uh, a higher rank at the time, but then Earl got shunted down. So I've always been interested in that and the, the armour and the battles and things like that. And as I got older and one gains a, a greater sophistication of understanding the, the politics behind various monarchs and so forth, but also 
the 17th century is a period that interests me from 1603, starting with the reign of James I, of course, who was the, the first Stuart monarch and was James VI of Scotland, took over from Elizabeth I because she had no issue. And he ended up uniting the thrones of England and Scotland. And then his son, Charles I, in, came to the throne in 1625. And I found that interesting, of course, because that was uh, the monarch that resulted in the English Civil War, which was quite an entertaining affair in itself because I think it very much summed up the character of the English, that the French would create um, barricades and have the guillotine and would be uh, wholesale ransacking and destroying their monarchy, whilst the same, whilst prior to that, with the English, there was a siege laid to a castle and then we would say, right, okay, you've lost, and they go, fair enough, Yes, we, we, we've lost. Well, that's okay. It was a jolly good siege. Uh, you gave your best. You can, you can march out now with all your soldiers. We'll see you next time. tally uh, all my best to your wife. And it was done in such a sort of almost like gentlemanly way compared to the bloody revolutions that you would see elsewhere. So that was quite interesting that uh, that's almost that very English characteristic uh, shone through all of that. But that whole period as well, because then you start to get the foundation of the English colonies as well in what became the United States, Jamestown being founded, and then going on from Charles I, you then, of course, got Cromwell, and then there was the restoration with uh, Charles II, and then James II with his short reign, and then in came William of Orange in 1688. Uh, so that's an interesting period of history as well for me. Why do you distinguish between narcissist and narcissistic, but no, not differentiate between empath and empathic? The reason being is that there are individuals that will behave in a narcissistic way, but aren't narcissists. And those distinctions relate to the necessity of control and the necessity of the receipt of fuel. So they share comparisons in terms of the level of narcissistic traits. There's uh, shared with regard to the issue of emotional empathy. It's very low for a narcissistic individual, uh, whereas it's non-existent for the narcissist. But there are distinctions as well. Whereas between uh, empath and empathic, I don't see that there's anything really to distinguish. It revolves around uh, emotional empathy. And of course, you can talk about, you see, a narcissistic person can be empathic, but it's very limited. And then you can have a normal person who's empathic. And as I've explained, they have this small circle of empathy. And as a consequence of that, they can have considerable empathy, emotional empathy for certain individuals, but they're more limited in number. And then, of course, you have the empath who has emotional empathy for a wider range of people. And all of those three categories are empathic. But I didn't see that there was a case for having a separate category of empathic on its own, that empathic would rather be a term for somebody who has emotional empathy. Uh, as a follow-up to this question, would you ever consider it if you decided that uh, the matrix that you built um, for different categories and schools and cadres, if you decided that something needs to be updated, would you do that? What do you mean create a category of empathic? Create a category, expand a category. Uh, would you yes, like I, the, the point is, is that there are, I think there are elements in some of uh, early works which I'll revisit and they'll just need a slight tweak and an adjustment to clarify certain aspects. So there's always a case for uh, refining ideas it won't be the case that there's a wholesale revision of them because the views and observations that I put forward, they're accurate. But there is always a case for refining an idea, perhaps expressing it in a more clearly way. It might be, for instance, that there's a, a certain distinction that would be useful to aid people's understanding with regard to the categorization of individuals, and therefore one would look at doing that. If I see that there's a better way of expressing something to help people understand, then that change should be affected. Mm -hmm. well, very happy to hear that. 
You mentioned once that in rare cases, people have been unable to complete the NARC detector owing to their emotional thinking. Were you able to help them get the answer that the NARC detector provides? It's up to you to complete the NARC detector. If you can't do it, then you're not going to get an answer. What you can do is have a consultation with me and talk about it. Some people prefer to do the NARC detector that way. It's more expensive because it takes longer talking about it because you're using my time rather than your own. So sometimes that's a way that somebody could get around it. Or it could be done in a more informal way, whereby I explain to people that you either, the most appropriate way is to do the NARC detector, or you can do the NARC detector in person, if you will. So we go through the NARC detector and I talk it through with you. Or you can talk about the circumstances and I'll say to you, I'm never going to give you a formal assessment because that has to be done through the NARC detector because that's the specifically asked um, questions. But I can say to you, you're likely to be dealing with a narcissist because there's lots of narcissistic indicators and explain what they are. So if somebody's not able to formally complete it, they could either speak to me and we go through it question by question, or they can just talk about their circumstances. The latter isn't me saying, I won't say for definite, because there has to be a standard with regard to the determination, but I can say you're likely to be pushing on an open door with regard to them being a narcissist based upon what you've said. So that's another way that person, but if you can't complete it and you're not willing to undertake a consultation, then ultimately you're just going to sit wondering whether you're dealing with a narcissist or not. You might be able to have that worked out to a degree by watching my videos and putting the pieces together, but it always helps to have that from an objective expert, which is me. You talk about the differing perspectives of the way narcissists view the world versus normals. That is subjective. How is it that you can look at things in shades of grey quite well? It's an interesting question. I have my perspective, but I also understand other people's perspectives because I've made it my business to do so. One of the central sort of tenets in what I regard as the world is the basis that we all have different perspectives that what you see and what you hear and what you taste and what you smell and what you touch is interpreted by your brain. Many people interpret that in a very similar way because they have all evolved in a similar way. Other people, and I'm not just talking about narcissism, interpret it in an alternative way because the way that their brain works is different. I often give the example that there's a particular pheromone that if one person smells it, it smells of sandalwood. If another smells it, it smells of urine. And if another smells it, they can't smell anything at all. The chemical composition of that pheromone hasn't altered. They interpret it differently because of the differing number of receptors in their nose. So it's similar. Someone who's chromesthesia, they see sound as color. I don't see sound as color. I don't think you do, Julia. And But some people do. They're not lying about that. I have a client and who's been a long-standing blog reader, she sees sound as colour. And that's because her brain works somewhat differently. So because I've always had this view that there are differing perspectives, I might not necessarily accept them as valid for me, but I, and I recognise that some people do bullshit and make these things up. I remember years ago, um, I was in a nightclub and I'd headed back to a house with a... Uh, prospective target to engage in a bit of jiggery pokery and her friend started to tell me about how the fact that she could see auras and I knew that this was bullshit she didn't at all um, so that wasn't a different perspective it was just bollocks that she was coming out with because she told me that I had bowel issues which I don't and didn't at the time so I knew that she was just making these things up but there are instances where someone will have that differing perspective but it's a genuine held belief because they see the world differently so with that being that platform I recognize that people see the world differently. When it comes to the worldview of normals and empaths and narcissists, it's imperative that I recognize and understand that. One, with regard to ensuring that I function effectively and efficiently in the pursuit of the prime aims and essentially uh, playing the games that I play. And then also for the purposes of di disseminating this information for people to gain that understanding.
So I have an open mind in that regard because I recognize that it's axiomatic to the purposes of the teaching that I engage in. <laughs> Would you put Fanny Willis under the Tudor scope? I'm glad you've explained who she is because I don't recognize the name. She's the district attorney in Fulton County, Georgia, investigating Donald Trump. She's now been investigated for improper behavior. That hasn't come across my uh, bows. I would say I don't have any immediate plans to analyze that individual. The pending list for the Tudor scope is pretty long. Uh, this would be actually, uh, uh, Megan Kelly did probably at this point a dozen shows on her. Okay. Again, if you can make a compelling case, for why she should be examined, and I think that that would appeal to the viewership, then I, I'm prepared to reconsider. All right, okay. Can someone suffering from dissociative identity disorder be a narcissist too? So in this instance, you're thinking about individuals that have what some people talk about alters. I we should imagine that one could well be a narcissist and you ask how would we handle a situation with them well in the way that you would do with any other narcissist you'd apply the principle of go so get out and stay out now you may well say well they're not behaving like a narcissist all of the time but we don't have the full information as to how often does this narcissist identity make an appearance um, presumably it makes enough appearance that it's going to be problematic for you that you don't want to be sitting around wondering and waiting for when it will appear. So the clear advice would be to steer clear of this person. Thank you, Jeepers Creepers. Okay. <laughs> Do you ever get bored answering all these questions about yourself? Of course not. <laughs> Or are you just endlessly fascinated by yourself? Well, I am very interesting, Pat. Um, with the questions, it can become a little bit boring when I get asked ones which are similar, but I do understand why people do that. But what you've got to remember is, one, I'm an interesting individual. Two, I do this because it's part of my engagement with my viewers that I recognize that it's just the pursuit of the prime aims. So by talking to people about me and helping you understand I'm able to assert control over the viewership. I draw a bit of fuel. It's not a lot, but I draw a bit of fuel by way of the responses. But it's all important with regard to the legacy. It helps me engage with people so they understand. It helps me furnish them with knowledge, which aids them. And that builds the profile that people feel that they know a bit of me, that they are invested in wanting to learn more about narcissism. So whilst I am this sort of mysterious entity that's this disembodied voice on the internet, asking questions about me enables people to understand about narcissism and learn a bit more about me. And I suppose it uh, fleshes me out as well. So it uh, humanizes me to an extent to people. So there's a value in that. And naturally, I'm perfectly happy to talk about myself until the point where I don't want to. Were you popular in school settings? Yes, I was. I wasn't the most popular boy in the class, but I was popular enough. I had a healthy stable of friends. I repeatedly had girlfriends. I was well-liked by teachers. So, uh, yes, I was popular, but I wouldn't say that I was the top of the tree. Probably because I didn't ask lick, and there was aspects of edge to me, naturally, with regard to my behavior. Narcissism is mental illness to an extent. Nurture plays a part, so do you pity them? No. I don't pity any narcissist. Basically, get a grip, sort yourself out. If you're a lesser narcissist, you're a fool. If you're a mid-range narcissist, you're a cowardly, worn-up, bald, shriveled-up, bald individual. I have often contempt for my fellow narcissists. Um, I'm having... Difficulty. I missed a couple of stickers. Uh, my apologies. That's okay. I, I can see them, and uh, I'll, 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 I'll shout those out. So thank you, Ghost, and thank you, Persa. And if there was anybody earlier on that has done a sticker, I've not mentioned. Um, you have my gratitude for recognizing through the Dirts Fund the value <laughs> of the Ultra. So thank you to those of you that have donated. Okay. 
Do most narcissists cheat or are any of them faithful? Most narcissists do cheat. Again, going back to what was mentioned earlier on about the different types of infidelity, there'd be some narcissists that wouldn't necessarily uh, go and have sex with somebody else, but they would cheat on you emotionally, intellectually, financially, but you might not necessarily regard that as infidelity. So, of course, first of all, the question is, is what do you regard as infidelity? There are some people that would regard looking at porn as being an act of infidelity. There are other people who say, no, that's just what many people do. That's not being unfaithful. So first of all is what you determine as being unfaithful. If you're saying do narcissists, infidelity is by going and having sexual intercourse with somebody or you know having oral sex with them or uh, kissing, if you deem all of those things from sort of kissing upwards as cheating, then most narcissists do cheat. There will be instances where some won't do so, um, but that is unusual. HG, what would you do if you advise Catherine, Princess of Wales, well done on getting her name right, regarding the merciless bullying campaign she is facing? The best thing to do is, of course, is ignore much of it and recognise that it comes from a place of envy that is invariably orchestrated by people who are rather thick, that you're not going to be able to persuade these individuals. So you're better off continuing to do what you do and focus on the people that support you rather than deal with the bullies. The fact is that when it comes to these individuals, you'll have a group that are entrenched who simply don't like her and never will. So you have to write those people off. There's no point doing some hearts and minds campaign to try and get them on board. It's a waste of your time. There is possibly a group that could be persuaded and you might apply some effort to that group where they might have a view of you which is incorrect and by correcting that view they change their view there are people whose views do change they're somewhat rarer beasts in society these days compared to how it used to be and then there are people who will be supporting her and those and they're numerous and uh, there's plenty of people that do so she needs to understand that these individuals that bully do so pursuant to a lack of understanding as to what she is deficiencies in their own lives, possibly because they nail their colours to supporting this one's wife as well, and ultimately let them get on with it. it. Ultimately, I'm sure that sometimes it upsets her, but other than that, she can remind herself of the fact that she's a, a beautiful lady who's well-liked by lots of people, who has a life of privilege. Meanwhile, there's some dumpy half-wit eating, eating a pot noodle. So who's the loser there? HG Cupcakes, is there any updates on the developments with your interview with Jordan Peterson? Which interview is that? I haven't had an interview with Jordan Peterson. Where are you Are you talking about whether there's going to be one? There's no update in that regard. Okay. Are you royalty, HG? Of course I am, and you better start showing me some respect as a consequence of my royal nature. I come from royalty. I've told you that before. Are you are you kind, HG? What's that? You mean are you kind? I can be kind, but it's not genuine. Do you feel any kind of relief or ease because we know what you are and you don't have to maintain a facade with us? Good question, Pat. No, I don't, because it's easy for me to utilize the facade that I have in the world uh, with people that actually know me. For some narcissists, of course, the maintenance of the facade takes a degree of effort. And of course, they are unaware narcissists, so they're never going to get themselves in a position of thinking, oh, I can be myself, I can be the narcissist, because they don't know what they are. And for those of us that are aware of what we are, but put a facade out in the world that mask our behavior, we're so good at it, it comes naturally to us. It isn't a burden. So I can understand why you might think that it would be some kind of relief to go, ah, you know what, all these people know who I am, so I don't have to put on any kind of pretense. But it's easy to do that in the world that I 
functioning. So no, it isn't a form of relief. What I do like is the fact that because I don't have to, because I tell you what I am, that's advantageous because it gives me an outlet to explain so much of why I do what I do, which I otherwise wouldn't be able to tell people. And that's not in a case of like getting it off my chest, but more in terms of being able to demonstrate that information to people because it's so interesting. I like to be able to share that information with people, which of course I can't do in my real life because then I would be giving the game away. So it's useful to have, because I have that intellectual curiosity and I'm a big believer in knowledge and sharing it. I find it useful to be able to do that with all of you because you know what I am. Do you work alone or have an assistant? Knowing the narcissist. So you mean in respect to what I call blog world, not my uh, professional life. It seems to be a lot of work for one person. I have a graphic designer. So I sometimes send him images or, and I give him a brief as to what I want him to create. And then he weaves his magic. So he creates the thumbnails and the, the book covers and some of the uh, things that appear in the knowledge vault. So I have assistance with that. I have a videographer. So with the creation of certain videos, um, she would assist with that. She helps me in sourcing certain uh, video material. I have one reader who hunts down footage for the Watch the Narcissist in Action series. And she creates the transcripts for me. So she watches the video and then creates the transcripts, which saves me a lot of time. So I do have sort of assistance around the edges, but I don't have a hot assistant in a pencil skirt who takes off her glasses and shakes her hair out. And I say, why, Miss Jones, you're beautiful each morning. So um, much I'm an army of one with a bit of help around the edges is the appropriate way of looking at it. How many novels have you written under other pseudonyms? What genre are they? Horror, crime, adventure, romance. Um, I've written, I think, in one genre, five novels, which is to do with uh, sort of historical fantasy. I've also written books which relate to things that I do professionally, but I don't want to say any more about those. <laughs> I picked up a lot of character traits from my ex. Is this normal for an empath? Well, it's normal for anybody because human beings are social creatures, AC. And so everybody mirrors to an extent. Some people, for instance, they start to mirror the way that somebody would talk, both in terms of the terminology that you use and perhaps adopting their accent. You might copy what somebody wears. You might drift towards liking the same type of music. So it's quite common for people to do that. Uh, of course, the justification and driver for it is different from why a narcissist does it but when you say a lot of character traits of course you don't exactly detail what they are and when you say a lot is it did your personality become mainly like theirs if so there might be something else going on there so picking up character traits from somebody else is something that can happen yes thank you daisy beach HG, what would it take for the fog to lift for Harry? Boggles my mind. He doesn't see how his wife has ruined his life. It would boggle your mind because you aren't affected by the emotional thinking that he has. So you can see it clearly. You can see the evidence. You can see the way that this one's wife behaves towards him. He doesn't. But I don't know, Daisy Beach, if you've ever been in a relationship with a narcissist. And if you have, you were probably unable to see certain behaviors that you were engaging in and you might never have realized them, or later on you did, and you look back and thought, who on earth was I? What did I become? And so for Harry, he can't see it because he's trapped in the manipulations and his own emotional thinking. What would it take for the fog to lift? It would need that emotional thinking to reduce. And the most likely way that would happen would be for him not to be spending time with her. So she's neither manipulating him and his emotional thinking starts to come down. And that would be whether through circumstance, he ends up spending time away with her, so from her rather. So for example, let's say he does decide to do the Africa thing and he's away from her physically, 
and with time differences, etc., it might mean that it's he's less able to speak to her as often as once did. And it might be that her attention goes elsewhere to try and ensnare somebody else with some lashings of spicy poontang so that her influence over him diminishes. So he stays out of the arenas of interaction, reducing his emotional thinking. Or, for instance, if she divorced him and they led separate lives. So the fog will lift when his emotional thinking comes down and his emotional thinking will come down as a consequence of not having as much to do with her. At the moment, he lives with her. As far as we're aware, he's seen with her quite a lot just recently. He's been enjoying some respite periods, and therefore his emotional thinking remains high. Thus, the fog is not going to lift, not anytime soon. Do narcissists have contempt for normals or others that they are not able to control? Yes. Any news on the cookie jar series? No news on that front. HG, can you be hypnotized? No, I can't. Can any narcissist be hypnotized? Potentially. If a person can't be hypnotized, are they then a narcissist? No. But, um, I would think that many narcissists would be resistant to it because it's a form of control. So they wouldn't necessarily volunteer for it. But to my mind, it's not something that just because you're a narcissist means that you're immune to being hypnotized. Hoping to have another bullshit bingo. Is that in the cards or on the cards? Um, I have no immediate plans to do so. It takes quite a bit of organization and I am rather busy. But who knows? Perhaps later in the year I will I will do so. A little treat for you all. I know that you, you very much enjoy doing that. I, I would like to do it again. It's just one of those things of it's on the list with lots of other things. It takes time. And as I mentioned in an earlier answer, I'm an army of one. You are the narcissist expert. You're a very sensible and wise individual, Jennifer. I can see that just in one sentence. Thank you for the compliment. Who is the empath expert? Well, I'm an expert on empaths as well. Uh, I have to understand them because they're my prey. I have to understand them in order to advise them as well, to understand the way that they tick. So I know a lot about empaths because I spent a lot of time with them, observing them, listening to them, torturing them, hearing them cry about things, telling them uh, how they behave, listening to their responses, etc. So I've amassed a lot of inter information about them, which gives me uh, expertise about them. But if you were to say, is there somebody perhaps who is an empath who also knows them inside out, I don't know of anybody. That's not to say that there isn't one. There may well be. I just don't know of them. Does your enjoyment of Depeche Mode mean you have an errant brain cell that allows you to be happy with regard to their music? How dare you suggest that I have an errant brain cell, you scoundrel? Um, no. Your member's video doesn't explain your enjoyment of them. I've explained it before. It's an intellectual enjoyment, but also it relates to a particular period of my childhood that I developed an interest in them. <coughs> Excuse me. And therefore, that has a connection with certain friends, which has endured to this day, which is a means of the pursuit of the prime aims. So it's an intellectual appreciation of them, nothing to do with an end brain cell. HG, how does us listeners struggle with wanting to learn from you, yet have issues with you being a narcissist? Well, it's understandable that some people may have a degree of apprehension about that. I think that there's possibly two places where that apprehension comes from. The first is that some people may find it morally reprehensible to receive information from somebody that's a narcissistic psychopath. It just doesn't sit well with you. You are entitled to that view, and if that prohibits you from receiving my information, you're losing out because of that attitude. But one understands that that may be why you adopt that approach. The other might be that you are concerned that you will suffer some kind of ill, uh, Ill doing or harm as a consequence of your interaction with me. All you need to do in that regard is speak within the blog or on YouTube videos, with other people who have used my services, look at the testimonials, and you will find 
that all of those individuals who have consulted with me, many of whom were very nervous at the outset, will explain what a constructive and useful experience it was and that they were not harmed, they were not devalued by me. I'm not a stupid man. I recognize that I am able to gain the prime aims by providing people with a meaningful experience in consultation and every single NARC detector that's been submitted has been dealt with. Every single empath detector, et cetera, that has ever been submitted, people have received the responses to them. Nobody's ever been ripped off. So I understand why people have concerns because I'm a narcissistic psychopath. You either have a moral objection to me and you either get over that or you don't. Or if you're worried that I'm somehow going to hurt you, you have to remember you're a tertiary source to me and that my the preservation of my legacy is far more important to me than lashing out at somebody that I don't really know. I save that type of thing for the people that really matter in my life. So if you've got those issues, you can put them to one side and understand that nobody's going to give you the information to the extent that I will, that will give you the insight to the extent that I will, and the practical assistance to the extent that I will, that will help you and gain freedom. But you don't need to listen to me tell you all of that. Go and look at what other people have to say. Read the reviews, read the testimonials, and make your own mind up. Go to the evidence, as I always say, and that'll help you. Can you share some experiences where your exceptional skills made a significant difference in the outcome of a project or situation? Well, I can't tell you about anything that's to do with my professional life because it'll give away my identity. So that's the main area where my skill sets are applicable. So that's not something that I can share. <laughs> Sorry. You've mentioned having different identities for various purposes. How many passports do you have and what nationalities are they under? Again, for reasons of protecting my identity, I'm not offering up that information. I'm not going to answer that. HG, does a narcissist lack mirror neurons because they only have cognitive therapy, uh, empathy rather? Uh, yes, that would appear to be the case. Well, good for you, Lisa. Okay. I took your empath detector and you told me I was a super empath. Well done on breaching the confidentiality provisions. <laughs> Last night I went supernova on my ex's toxic narc mother and I never felt better. Well, good for you. Done with that entire family and at peace. Well, I'm pleased that that's given you the outcome that has given you that peace case 6-9 and that you've gained further understanding of yourself. And uh, thank you for that endorsement of my work. Right. Can you share an experience where you found a profound spiritual connection that affirmed your sense of destiny or purpose? I can't. I'm not a spiritual individual. Have you ever reconnected with your angel from your school days? No. HG, I saw something on a false flag empath. Is this a new kind? No, it's not a new kind of empath. And you didn't see it on your results because it wasn't applicable to you. How do narcissists recognize other narcissists but not themselves? Well, quite simply, they will have learned something about narcissism which allows them to identify it in other people. But their narcissism, as you know, prevents them from that self-reflection which would cause them to understand what they are. It also because of the necessity of maintaining control and nullifying threats to control, doesn't allow the narcissist to see what they are. So this is one of the peculiarities that the narcissist can, in some instances, and do so correctly, point out that somebody else is a narcissist, although they often get it wrong, accusing empaths of being narcissists. But it is the case that, a, that an unaware narcissist is able to identify somebody else correctly as a narcissist, but they just can't see it in themselves because the narcissism blinds them to it. So they're allowed to see the behaviors in somebody else. They're not allowed to see it in themselves. Mm -hmm. 
HG, you clearly you know clearly the dark triad. There are narcissists, psychopaths, and sociopaths, but what do you think about the Machiavellianism type? Do you think there is a fourth type of disorder? No, I wouldn't put that as a separate disorder. The Machiavellianism comes within the uh, behavior of uh, psychopaths and within behavior of narcissists. It's one of the factors that is applicable to a greater narcissist. So I wouldn't place it as a separate disorder of itself. HG, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> HG, have you ever been to a Comic Con and have you ever cosplayed? <laughs> if so, what character? I have not been to a Comic Con. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say I've sort of cosplayed. I think it's more to do with, um, for me, I sort of see sort of cosplaying as more a, a hobby. But I have dressed up as a particular character when I've been invited to certain uh, birthday parties where fancy dress was required. And it won't be a surprise for you to learn that uh, I appeared as Darth Vader. <laughs> <laughs> Wielding my lightsaber. Hi, HG. Oh, it's gone. I'm sorry. That's okay. okay. Hi, HG. Do you think the Oscars this past weekend will wake Harry and his wife up in terms of talent and relevance? Not a chance. This one's wife will never wake up as to what she is. She's incapable of doing so. And it won't with Harry. The fact that they were NFI'd will simply be dealt with by her narcissism as, well, we've got better things to do, and they're clearly envious of us, so that's why we weren't involved. And Harry probably is re relieved because he's not that keen on the celebrity side of things. He goes along with it because if he didn't, the pink pods would get tasered by this one's wife. But he prefers the sort of charitable side of things and, of course, getting lashed at Bonkers Night Spot. But... It's her that wants the celebrity. And her narcissism will simply explain to her that the failure to invite her was just down to people uh, being nasty that they uh, don't truly understand uh, or would say to her, well, couldn't do it anyway this weekend because um, we'd already arranged to go and hijack somebody's birthday in Uvalde. So we weren't around. So it won't wake her up. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> night of june thank you for the donation were you at the game on sunday no i wasn't i as julia knows i was following it on television <laughs> Ooh, check you out 27 how many guitars do you own hg i have three HG, how did you choose the career you do professionally without revealing what you presumably do? Um, <clears throat> well, I have fingers in a number of different pies, I think is the uh, fairest way of describing it. And so I've done different things. The main thing that I've done professionally, I chose because it gave me the right level of excitement. It enabled me to do certain things with particular legitimization that ordinarily you wouldn't be able to do. It enabled me access to certain information, which ordinarily you wouldn't be able to uh, obtain. So it was something that enabled me access and uh, enabled me to do things which I would find interesting. Uh, less um, uh, less boring, if you will, and enabled me to uh, utilize particular skill sets that I have that I, if I, in one respect, that I'm ready made for, if I can describe it as such, that the way that I am as a narcissistic psychopath, it lends itself to this particular uh, career or profession that makes me highly effective and of course the training that i then received uh, bolstered what was already there as an inherent part of me so it was all about choosing it because i found it exciting and interesting so it would alleviate the boredom it's certainly not dull what i do it's very varied it allows me to wield a particular level of power through access to 
people and information. It allows me to do things which um, ordinarily you wouldn't be allowed to do. And I'm made for it. So that's why I chose it. Did you always want to do that career or it came at a later stage? It wasn't something as a child that I thought I would end up doing. But then I don't think any child would have necessarily thought about it because it's you know, children think more about being an astronaut or a professional footballer, don't they? Or being an ice cream man or such like. I don't think many people would actually understand what it is if you were to tell them. So um, it came later. What were you thinking you were going to do when you were a child? What did I think I was going to do? I <laughs> wanted to be a journalist originally. Right. When did you first find out about Christopher Hitchens? Ooh, I don't know precisely when. Um, it came as a consequence of material um, on the internet. So it's in the last sort of 10 to 15 years, I would suspect. Uh -huh. All right. Uh -huh. <laughs> HG, would you be okay having an actor play you in a movie relating to a person escaping a narcissist? So what we have is I'm, are they escaping me? That, then that's just not realistic, is it? I mean, come on, we want something that's realistic. So is, is the premise that there's somebody playing me H.G. Tudor and it's about somebody escaping H.G. Tudor? Okay. Well, in that case, I wouldn't have a problem with somebody playing me. Um, I wouldn't be interested in playing me, although I am an actor to an extent. It goes with the territory. I'm not a professional actor. So those of you who think I'm H.G., uh, Hugh Grant rather, I'm not. Um, so I'm not really bothered about that. And certainly at this stage, I wouldn't play myself because I need to protect my identity. Um, I'd be perfectly content for an appropriate actor to play me as long as I thought that they represented me appropriately, that were suitably ruggedly handsome and conveyed the brilliance of who I am. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't have an issue with that. Do you find it more entertaining to manipulate and play games with other narcissists or empaths? Which one's reactions are more amusing? I don't think that I would necessarily say that there is a preference overall. I think there are different circumstances where I find it entertaining. I find, ent I find manipulating anybody entertaining. I think with the empaths, what's more entertaining is the slavish devotion that they demonstrate to trying to resolve the situation when they're being manipulated. With the narcissist, it's the way that they try and regain the control um, because they invariably will have different reactions. I find those of the narcissist often pettier than that of the empath, and that amuses me. And also because they are meant to be good at manipulation, but when they come up as against me, they are um, they find themselves wanting. So I find that amusing. But also, the reaction with uh, an empath is far more deep seated because, of course, the narcissist is superficial. So there's different things that I get from the different type of classification of person. So they can be amusing in different circumstances. Do you tickle? Do you mean, do I tickle other people or am I ticklish? If you're wondering, do I tickle other people? Yes, I have done. And am I ticklish? No. And if you attempted to tickle me, you'd soon regret it. Were you a gifted child, HG? Yes, I was. So your suspicions are accurate. Give yourself a pat on the back and have a chufty badge. I agree, it is. Did you know more than your teachers at any age? I knew more about me than they knew about me. So that was clear. Did I have a greater knowledge than them? 
of course, within certain subjects, they had been doing that for a lifetime and I hadn't. So to say that I would know more than them about that particular subject, no. There were certain things that were later in life that people were seeking to teach me things where my knowledge was greater than theirs. And that related more to what I did professionally, which was in part linked to what I am. Did you study literature formally? Yes, I studied literature at A level. Mm -hmm. How would a narcissist feel about their mortality, including yourself? Well, the narcissist will, for instance, a mid-range narcissist, the question of mortality is a problem. They fear death because, of course, narcissists do experience fear. And the concept of mortality is a threat to control. It's an issue for me also. But I don't fear death because of my psychopathy. I've been in situations where my life has been th under threat. Naturally, it didn't go that way I'm because I'm talking to you now. I was naturally concerned because I didn't want to die, but I wasn't frightened. And the issue of my own mortality is such that it's an irritation because it is ultimately a threat to control. And as I've explained, Alpha Red, elsewhere, that that's why I've created the legacy that I have for the purposes of outmaneuvering my mortality, that the knowledge that my work will live on after my death means that I nullify that threat to control. There's also the fact that there's so much that's going to come that I would like to know about, because as I've explained before, I have a particular thirst for knowledge. And I've also explained before that one of the things that I would like to be able to do would be to download the essence of what I am and either be able to live on in a virtual environment or that I would be downloaded into a new meat suit. Because whilst the one that I'm in at the moment is glorious and delightful, it's not going to be immune to aging. And at some point, and it's a long way off yet, it'll start to fail me. And therefore, if I was able to take the essence of who I am and place that in a new meat suit so that I could then live on and see these other things, not only would that nullify that threat to control posed by mortality, it would also address my thirst for knowing what the world would look like and enable me, of course, to continue to play the games that I enjoy so much. So mortality is an issue for us. My view on it is different to that of many other narcissists because the, cost, the uh, consequence of fear plays upon them. Do you think avoidance attachment is a form of narcissism? No, I think it's something that's separate to the question of narcissism, that there are people who are not narcissists that may behave in an avoidant way. Are spiritual leaders mostly narcissists? Well, I don't have any survey that says that 75% of them are. Anecdotally, a lot of spiritual leaders are narcissists. The reason being that it is a very effective way of getting to the prime aims and therefore appeals to narcissists because you can control a lot of people by virtue of a formal congregation or followers, that you receive fuel from their reactions to what you tell them, what you preach, what you prescribe to them. It gives you lots of people to get character traits from, and there's residual benefits. It assists with facade management. It could assist monetarily. It might give you a place to live, for example. And therefore, the question of religion and spirituality is very appealing to a narcissist. Also, of course, the concept of that you might have been imbued with certain powers as a consequence of your spirituality fits with the magical thinking of a narcissist. And also the concept of using an imaginary friend to enable you to control people, one whose word is absolute, whose word, if you don't obey it, you'll end up in a lake of fire, is a very powerful means of asserting control over people. So religion and spirituality are hugely attractive to narcissists 
And that's why many leaders will be narcissists. You also will need those that are true believers. Because, of course, if you look at it from an evidential point of view, the concept that there was somebody that created this world and therefore they allow certain horrible things to happen which don't really make sense doesn't really stand up to scrutiny. And, of course, if you believe in religion, that's your right and your entitlement and comes back to that point I'm making about different perspectives. But the point is that in order to have that true belief in that what I call an imaginary friend, that is often something that you will find with a narcissist rather than someone else, that there will be individuals, they may never admit it, but privately they may have uh, a crisis of faith because they realize that it doesn't quite stack up for them. But for the narcissist, they are invariably the true believer. And therefore, they would never, ever doubt that there is no God or no great architect in the sky. So again, it's an environment that very much appeals to narcissists. Yeah. Take the last couple of questions, uh, Julia, because I'll need to wrap up in a couple of minutes. Right. Could you explain the difference between emotional thinking versus intuitive thinking? Thank you. Well, I don't talk about intuitive thinking. I talk about the difference between emotional thinking and logical thinking. Um, so I'm not sure what you necessarily mean by intuitive thinking because it's not a definition that I use. So I'd invite you, Blue, to email me about that and perhaps uh, expand on what you see intuitive thinking as being. And then it might be, for instance, we're talking about the same thing or by understanding what your definition of intuitive thinking is, I'll then be able to give you an answer. How is it possible that Taylor Swift writes so many songs from perspective of empathic, sensitive people with which many empathic people can identify very easily? She watches and she listens and she observes in the same way that I do. How is it that I'm able to write pieces which are done from the empathic perspective when I'm a narcissistic psychopath? I watch, I listen, I observe. I character traits acquire from those empaths in the things that they say and the things that they do. Taylor Swift recognizes that as part of her facade as a greater, she needs to convey the idea that she's on these people's side, that she understands the way that they think. And therefore, she pays attention to all of that. And because of her greater narcissism, it affords her that insight as well. That's why she's so effective at it. Last one. Thank you, Ghost. You're welcome, Zainab. I'll take one more question, Julia. Goodness. <laughs> a good one to end with no it doesn't so you can stop driving around looking for that um, i don't actually have a personalized plate although i did think about having tudor on it as a joke but um i don't think uh, I, I will do that but uh, ultra one is a pretty good one if you want to buy that for me you landy i'll stick it on my car Okay, thank you very much, Julia, for chairing this uh, live stream, the question and answers. Thank you to all of you for your awesome. interesting and varied questions. Julia and I are going to look to do this on a uh, regular basis. So keep your eyes peeled for announcements on the YouTube channel as to when it's going to take place, and you can come prepared with your questions. Thank you very much for joining both of us. Thank you, everyone.